Thank you, Pam. Um, it's been a pleasure to, um, to be working on this series um, and to have all these fabulous folks um, join us for the 2019-2020 season. So uh, this January's program is no exception with our local gardening expert, the gardening guy, Henry Holmeyer. Um, the program's pretty clear, but I'll just read to you his, his credentials. Um, Henry Holmeyer, the gardening guy, is a freelance writer, garden designer, organic gardening educator and consultant based in Cornish, Cornish Flat, New Hampshire. He's been a UNH master gardener for more than 20 years and writes a weekly gardening column for 10 newspapers in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. He also formerly blogged at the Daily UV, which then became Herecast, which is now no longer, but um, is working, I know, on a, a new website and way to communicate his articles with everybody. Um, and in, in addition to being life partners, we're gar co-gardeners, and which is sometimes makes for some fun fireworks in the garden, but also <laughs> uh, I have learned so much over the years of knowing Henry, and I know that you will today too. Henry Hohmeyer. Well, thank you for coming today. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you to the Munshire Museum. I've never spoken in this particular venue before, but it's a great space. I remember b being at the Howe Library many times, and uh, sometimes we had standing room only, but we've got plenty of space here, and the technology seems to work very well. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, before I get started on my talk, I do want to mention that I do make house calls. So I no longer do any hands-on gardening for clients, but I do do consulting. I can come to your house, talk to you about your soil and the plants that are there, and what to do about the problem tree. And um, I do some pr professional pruning still. In fact, I fell out of an apple tree last summer and cracked a bone in my leg uh, while pruning in Hanover. But uh, that hasn't daunted me. I'm, I'm back up in the trees again. Um, after the talk, I will be over at a table uh, next to the gift shop, and I have my four gardening books. I actually found a copy of my first book, which came out with University Press of New England in 2002. I have just two copies of this to sell today, but I do have all my other books, and I brought the Cobra Head Weeder. How many of you have a Cobra Head Weeder? What do you think of it? It's the best darn weeding tool in America. So I, I dug around in my closet today. I could only find six of them. So no, no, uh, no fighting. Uh, they are available at West Lebanon Supply also. And the Cobra Head is just Cobra Head, all one word with a capital H for head. So uh, today we're going to talk about vegetable gardening. First of all, I just want to get an idea of my audience. How many of you grow vegetables? Oh, excellent. I sort of thought that. And how many uh, start some of your plants indoors in the early spring? Anybody? Yeah. Wow, quite a few, good. Um, we're gonna look at some slides and uh, talk about what I do and what you can do to maximize growth and have good, healthy uh, plants. I've been growing vegetables since my grandfather introduced me to gardening back in the late 1940s as a toddler. So I've been doing it for a long time, and I figured a few things out. Um, one of them is that I want to be an organic gardener. And I think it's useful just to mention what organic gardening really is. It means using no chemicals, not just no pesticides or herbicides, you know, the Roundup you put on your walkway to kill the weeds. Um, there are lots of other ways of doing things. But I believe that being an organic gardener and really improving the soil uh, gives me healthier plants and, and better production of my vegetables. So my grandfather was an early a, a proponent of uh, organic gardening, and I've been doing it ever since. I'm also um, interested in saving my back as I get older. I like to uh, find ways to save my back. Uh, this is called a veg trug. On the left, you can see it when it's just before I planted anything. Uh, it's six feet long, two feet wide, 
and it's in profile, it's a V shape, so that in the middle it's 16 or 18 inches deep. So I can grow a tomato in there. On the right, you'll see a close up. There is a, uh, a tomato there, some lettuce, sage, other herbs in the front here. I have this right near my front door, right near my wood pile. And um, it's a terrific way where you don't have to bend over. It's 30 inches tall. Um, another way to save the back is to have a good kneeler. And this really helps, I don't know about you, but some of my joints sort of make creaky noises when I get up and down. And um, these handles, you know, you can sort of push yourself up. It's, it's, a, very nice, uh, it's a very nice tool. Speaking of tools, there's the cobra head, and I do have a few of those, as I said. It's important to get your weeds out all the way to the base of the root. There's, there's some dandelions with a tap-rooted plant. You really need to loosen the soil, and the cobra head does that. Um, starting seedlings indoors is fun, and I love it. It sort of gets me through the mud season. Not everybody wants to do it. But uh, the, the key thing, if you want to grow some plants indoors, is to find out what you can't easily get at the local greenhouse. So for me, that's some heirloom varieties of tomatoes that I have saved seeds for many, many years, including one tomato that I picked up the seeds in France, hiking the Chemin de Saint-Jacques de Compostelle, when I ate a tomato at a, at a farmer's market, and I said, oh my goodness, this is an amazing tomato. So I put some seeds in my backpack, brought them back, grew them out, and I've been growing them ever since. Um, you can't buy those, so I want to grow them. But you have lots of nice um, uh, garden centers around. I buy a lot of vegetable starts from um, Edgewater Farm. I don't start everything from seed indoors. But it's, it's worthwhile knowing that there are plenty of people who do have all kinds of great plants. This is my front walkway, which is just flowers right now. But I can see later on, when I'm in my 90s, I might have a tomato in there. I might have an artichoke. Artichokes are very beautiful plants. Uh, you can grow vegetables in, in pots. And right now, there are lots of self-watering pots that have a water reservoir in the bottom, so the plants don't dry out and go through that from really wet to really dry in the course of a day. They keep it, your, your soil um, moderately moist. So now let's get into vegetables. You can see my best artichoke I ever grew right here. <laughs> no, that's a sculpture out in Castroville, California, which is the home of most artichokes that you buy at the grocery store. But uh, on the right, you see some artichokes that I did grow. And I like to say that Growing artichokes is fun, but it's not really, it doesn't really produce a lot of food. A big artichoke plant is this big around, in my garden anyway. In California, they get much bigger. In California, they're perennial. I would like to suggest that if you want to grow artichokes, that rather than starting in mid-February, such as I have done, and growing them under lights for two or three months, and tricking them. Artichokes aren't very smart, so you can trick them fairly easily into thinking they've been through one winter because they won't produce an artichoke until their second season uh, under normal conditions. So what I have had to do is start them until they've got three or four nice leaves, then move them into my basement, which stays between 35 and 50 for 10 days under lights, and then bring them back up into a warm growing area. That makes them think they've gone through a winter and then they will produce artichokes. Otherwise, you may have artichokes that have big, beautiful plant uh, leaves, but then they don't produce any artichokes. The ones I bought at Edgewater Farm in Plainfield uh, do produce artichokes the first year, in part because they have them growing in greenhouses that get very cold at night. So they need rich soil, lots of sun, and they're a decorative plant as much as anything else. I remember going to Iona in the uh, Inner Hebrides and going to a little uh, cloistered garden and seeing artichokes growing with these beautiful purple thistly-like blossoms. And they weren't growing them for the food, but just for the, for the beauty of them. Arugula. 
Arugula is a great herb to use for lots of things. You know it. What you might not know is that it can take over your garden. You want to make sure you don't let it go to seed. If it blossoms, it gets bitter anyway. So you, the thing to do is just dig it up as, as soon as it starts to blossom. Otherwise, I have a friend who let them all go to, to seed, and then her garden was full of arugula being pulled. She had to pull them out like weed for years. Asparagus. Asparagus is one of the best investments you can make. How many of you grow asparagus? Then you know that the first year you don't get to eat any asparagus, the second year maybe a couple of sp sp spears, and then the third year you can really start eating. What you might not know is that you should, in any year, you should never pick them for more than six weeks. I had a gardening client years ago in Windsor uh, who bought the house, and there was a beautiful asparagus patch, and he kept picking and picking all summer long. And I said, Jim, you've got to stop picking. Your plants are going to run down. They need the, the greenery to, to, to pump up the roots for next year. Well, he wouldn't listen to me, so he picked all summer long. And the next year, he had very few asparagus spurs. He said, what happened? I said, Jim, you should have stopped when I said so. So usually a month is enough to pick. Um, but if you, if you have a, a mature patch and good soil and good sun, uh, you can pick a little bit longer, but don't overdo it. So a uh, planting uh, nowadays, in the old days, you had to plant them down a foot deep. But nowadays, you just make a trench. You spread the roots out, as you see here, and um, cover them up. Uh, when they start to send up their first little green spears, you add more soil until you've got the soil up to ground level. Mulching is good. Here's my asparagus patch with uh, newspapers and wood chips. Weeds are a real problem for asparagus. If you don't keep your asparagus patch weeded, you won't get nearly the production you will if you keep it weeded. Basil. We're into the bees now. This is going to be a long talk if we're only in B. <laughs> uh, the key on basil is to, is to give it um, plenty of sunshine, rich soil, and pinch off those flowers as soon as they start. You want your basil to branch out. You don't want it to turn bitter, which it will do uh, if you don't pinch off the flowers when they come to bud. When it's planting time for something like basil or tomatoes, it's good to check what your soil temperature is. There's a simple thermometer there that uh, says it's 50 degrees. That's a little too cool for me for my tomatoes and basil. I like to plant them around the 10th of June, say 9 AM. Uh, <laughs> by then, the soil should be 50 or 60 degrees. 60 is the best. Um, you don't want to put something that you've coddled and taken care of and it's been in a nice warm environment into cold soil. So if you're serious about vegetable gardening, having a, a soil thermometer is a good thing. Beans. There are two basic types of beans, pole beans and bush beans. Pole beans need support. The great thing about pole beans is they will continue producing beans all summer long. Once they start, if you, so long as you keep picking them, they will keep producing. Bush beans, on the other hand, have one load of beans, and then they're done. They'll produce beans for about three weeks. They're great if you want to freeze beans or make dilly beans, canned beans. Um, but the, I like to have at least one tripod of pole beans that will give me beans right into the fall. Now, the other alternative, of course, is just plant a few bush beans this week, and then next week you plant a few more, and the following week a few more. If you're organized enough to do it, that's great. Or you can have pole beans. Here's a nice mix of beans I get from Renee's Garden Seeds. Uh, they have purple, yellow, and green beans all in there. The disappointment on the purple beans is that when you cook them, they turn brown, like most purple things. Beets. If I had one recommendation on to how to succeed with beets, it would be to say, by the 4th of July, you've got to have your, your beets and your carrots well thinned. If they're too crowded, they're not going to produce big beets. 
Uh, they like plenty of moisture, and like any plant, any vegetable, they need at least six hours of day of sunlight per day. That's considered full sun, six hours. Um, blackberries. It's important to cut back the canes that uh, produced last year, produced fruit last year, in the spring or the fall. Uh, you're looking there at a pole pruner uh, that I can reach into my blackberry patch and cut the canes right at the ground. I like the pole pruner because I don't need a blood transfusion after working in the patch. And I now have a pole pruner that has a cut and pick, which means that it, it has a little plastic mouthpiece that'll grab onto the, the stem and then I can pull it out more easily. They need to be supported or they're gonna fall over. Uh, blackberries and raspberries want to travel. They send out roots. So if you plant a nice row straight down here, if you don't pay attention, pretty soon it'll be a 10-foot wide patch of blackberries. That's what happened to me. I got some plants and let them go. Uh, and then it's really hard to pick. So I like them supported and separated so that you can get in there and pick the berries. Now, I want to show you a, a Pruning for, for blueberries is important. I want to show a, a fruit bud and a leaf bud. Now, you see this difference in size? The leaf buds are tiny and pointy. The fruit bud is much bigger and more rounded. So when you go out to prune this spring, and you can start in March or April and, and clean up, you want to take out, you want to leave as many stems with the fruit buds. Hey, what are you doing? Here we go. And if you have to take things out, it's worthwhile to take some of those that just are producing leaves. If it's not producing fruit this year, it's not going to produce it next year, I'm told. So each bud, each of those fruit buds, produces a number of, of berries. On the right is a witch's broom. It's caused by a virus. If you see that in your, in your blueberry patch, take your hand pruners, cut it out, put it in the household trash. It's a virus. You don't want it. All right, broccoli. Broccoli is easy to grow. And um, I had a little, I made a little garden for a couple of older women down in Cornish Flat, a little eight foot by 10 foot garden one year. And in it, I had two broccoli plants. And uh, they each produce a nice big fat head. And I came back the next week after they'd harvested the heads, and the plants were gone. And I said, what happened to your broccoli plants? Oh, I said, well, they produced, and they're done. So we pulled them out. But what you're seeing here are lots of side shoots. And if you have the right varieties of broccoli, um, they will just keep on producing side shoots, and much smaller than uh, the big head you get for the first one. But they're just as tasty. Uh, Brussels sprouts. For a while, I was getting very small Brussels sprouts because I let my plants keep on growing and growing and growing. What you have to do is on Labor Day weekend, you need to go in. You see what I've cut off there uh, in this uh, picture here. That's the top of the plant. Brussels sprouts will keep on getting taller and taller and putting their energy into getting tall and not pumping up the size of those sprouts that you want to eat. So if you cut the top off around the 1st of September, uh, then they'll start to, to produce big uh, Brussels sprouts like you see on the right. Cabbage is a nice crop. Uh, I don't grow a lot of cabbage, mainly because other people do it better. And the other thing is that Bugs love to eat cabbage. So uh, I'd like to say that's my cabbage, but I don't think that actually is. <laughs> Mine would have holes all over the place. <laughs> but you can prevent the, uh, the bugs from getting at your cabbage by covering it with something called reme or row cover. It's a very thin film of synthetic uh, fabric, and I use it on my cucumbers and on my squash plants to keep insects off. But you're phys as, an, as an organic gardener, I'm physically keeping the bugs from getting to my squashes and uh, 
cucumbers, you can do the same thing with cabbages. I guess I just don't eat that much cabbage. Uh, carrots are great. Here it is with some other winter vegetables, celeriac and, and Brussels sprouts. Many years ago, I went to the, to the Tunbridge Fair and uh, I looked at the carrot exhibit and there was a guy who had carrots that were 12 to 18 inches long. And I said, this is not possible. This, so I, I, said, I said, Joey Klein. So I, I had to find out who Joey was and I went up to see him. He lived right on the banks of the Winooski River and his soil was a sandy soil that was just deep with no stones. And he said, there are a couple ways you can get a big, tall, big long carrot. He said, first of all, you have to have fluffy soil. You have to keep uh, giving carrots a little extra nutrition. So he would take Progro, which is an organic bagged fertilizer made in Bradford, Vermont, and he would, first of all, he'd thin them appropriately, and then he would add Progro in a line next to his carrots, and he would scratch it in about once a month. So he was pumping them up with extra nutrition. He had sandy soil, and, and he made sure that they got plenty of moisture. But he said the key is you also have to have a carrot that will grow long. So when you read the catalog, see what they say, because some carrots uh, are naturally short and stubby, and others are uh, able to grow longer. And I regularly now grow 12 inch long carrots because I built a raised bed for carrots with fluffy soil and um, did everything I needed to do and they, they grow great. Well, Yellowstone is the one I have the best of, uh, luck with. It. It's a yellow carrot, but um, there, are, there are a number of varieties and off the top of my head. I couldn't tell you which are the orange and purple ones, but the catalogs or seed catalogs will always tell you. Cauliflower is, is the fussy child. You know, some of you have had lots of kids that are, get along with each other and everybody else, and then there's one that fusses all the time. Well, cauliflower is the fussy vegetable. If it gets too dry, it will button, which is to say it will just produce a cauliflower this big. If it gets too hot, it will button. If it gets too wet, it will button. Uh, consequently, for many years, I didn't grow cauliflower. And then I was at Edgewater Farm one day, and they said, purple cauliflower. I said, ooh, purple, That's, that sounds good. So I bought a six pack, and out of the six, three or four actually produced a nice head of, of cauliflower, and the other two didn't do much. Um, and it is really a beautiful, a beautiful uh, vegetable to have, to serve when you're having company. I saved this until I had people coming over so I could bring it up from the garden and say, look what I grew. <laughs> Because, of course, when I cooked it, the purple kind of went away and it looked sort of brown. But, and if you look at the leaves, uh, fungal diseases, insects, uh, it's not an easy plant to make happy and, and look good. But uh, the other thing is, you know, broccoli has all these side shoots. Cauliflower, its cousin, makes one head. It doesn't give you anything other than that one, that one meal. Uh, celery is a plant I don't grow. I find that when I grow it, it's stringy, it attracts aphids, it attracts bugs of all sorts. Uh, it needs lots of moisture, and I don't know what makes it happy, but I've never had any luck with it. Instead, I grow celery root or celeriac, which is fabulous. I started from seed, it takes a long time to grow indoors, so I would, st I would start this usually first of March, under lights. Uh, they need plenty of moisture, but it gives you the celery flavor uh, from this big fat root, and it's great in soups and stews, and you can keep it for six months. If you have a nice spare refrigerator, put it in the vegetable drawer, it'll last practically forever. Uh, chives are one of the few perennial vegetables we have. Uh, you can buy them, start it already, put it in a place uh, near the house for, for use in, on, on a regular basis in cooking. You can dig up a plant like that in the fall, put it in a pot, and uh, leave it outdoors. 
if you bring it indoors, it'll start growing again. So uh, you can have two or three pots, use one up, put the pot back outside, bring in the next one, and you can have chives for your baked potatoes all winter. Cilantro, very fast growing, quick to bolt or flower. Again, once they flower, they're not so very tasty, but easy enough to grow. Corn, I rarely grow, because if I grow it, the raccoons get it. I don't see any raccoons coming around the garden for anything else, but if I want to do it, uh, right here you'll see that's a 98 uh, tray. It's a regular flat with 98 little compartments. Each compartment's only an inch across, roughly, maybe this deep. And I will plant the seeds, put it on a heat mat, and it will pop almost immediately. When you plant corn outside, you have two problems. First are the crows, which want to eat the small shoots. And then once it gets to be this tall and it has actual corn, then the raccoons want it. So you really have to fence your corn crop if you want to get a corn crop and use electric fencing as well because raccoons can climb over most fences. Um, but that's corn on the right that I did grow. And so it is possible, it's just farm stands do it so well. And um, I've asked a corn farmer, how did, he, uh, how did he keep the raccoons away? And he said, I shoot them before the season, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of the crows, Cindy and I planted a, a bunch of corn one year, and then we went off on a vacation, came back, and no, no corn came up. So I started digging around to see, had the corn seed rotted? No, it had all germinated, and it had all been eaten by the crows. Now, I was in the Peace Corps in West Africa. They have a solution for it there. They, it's known as a small boy. And they, they keep the birds away from their crop by having small boys out there to, to chase the birds away. But I didn't have a small boy to do that. Cucumbers. Uh, I love cucumbers. They're easy to grow. I like to grow them on trellises. Do I have a picture of a trellis? No, I don't. Um, the problem I had starting many years ago is a striped cucumber beetle. Do any of you have a little black and yellow beetle that gets on your cucumbers, the squashes? It can really, when the first two uh, cotyledon seeds come out of the ground, the, the, these cucumbers show up and eat those two seeds off, and then you have to start again. So it took me a long time to figure out that if I just draped uh, reme or row cover right over the hill of, of cucumbers, that I could uh, keep the beetles away to a large degree. Uh, growing them on trellises really works well. Dill is, is another nice crop. I love dill in a salad. Once you've had it, it will throw seeds and those seeds will uh, start next year's crop and the year after. If you just let it go in the same place, it's, it's pretty much sure to keep on coming back. Eggplant. Eggplant, <clears throat> I don't grow very much because I'm not really fond of eggplant, but I know how to grow it. It needs heat. And there are two ways to do it. Uh, one way is to cover it with reme or row cover or some other thing that'll hold the heat in. And unlike many things, it does not need to be, it just, it's wind pollinated. Do I have that right? Hold on, no, it's not wind pollinated. Peppers are wind pollinated. Eggplants do need uh, insects to pollinate them, so you can't leave that row cover on once they start to flower. The other thing you can do to increase the heat is to put big black stones next to your plants. So they will absorb heat all day, and then at night they'll, they'll throw off some heat. And even a few degrees of, of warmth uh, will make quite a difference. Garlic is one of the easiest crops I grow. I plant it, I mulch it, and I harvest it. That's it. Because if it's properly um, mulched, you don't need to weed it. So you can see I've got rows there about six or eight inches apart. I plant the, the cloves three inches, two to three inches apart, two to three inches deep. I add some pro growth to the row. It's good, rich soil. There's always compost in it. And it's just plant it and then harvest it. So there you see it, 
what it looks like. It's come through the winter. You plant it in October. It sets down its roots. It gets established. And then um, it comes right up through what that was 12 inches of fluffy hay that I put down on it. And then the snow and rain has made that go down to about a four or five inch layer of mulch. And the shoots come right through. How many of you grow horseradish? Anybody? It's a great um, <clears throat> condiment if you like it. But what you need to know is that once you planted it, you can never, ever get rid of it. It is there forever. Its roots will go down two feet and more. If you try to dig up a big horseradish root, there'll be some that break off and stay there. Uh, you can control it with a lawnmower or with pavement. So you can, <laughs> <laughs> you can plant them right next to the, the road or you can have it right next to a mowed lawn. Otherwise, they will continue. The bed will get bigger and bigger. I had a friend whose husband went out with a rototiller to, to rototill the garden one year, and he rototilled the, the horseradish, and it got everywhere. It was, it was a nightmare. Uh, the roots you see there on the right, um, you would peel, then uh, put either in a blender or in a Cuisinart, and add uh, vinegar, white vinegar, to make your, uh, your horseradish sauce. Kale, I love kale. I have a bumper sticker. I had a bumper sticker on my old car that said, eat more kale. Kale is something, well, you can see on that picture on the left, it can get snowed on and frozen, and it's still tasty. It freezes well. Uh, if you put them in Ziploc bags, I like to blanch it briefly before freezing it, which means I, I drop it in um, uh, boiling water just for 60 seconds or less. Uh, if, you, if you blanch your vegetables too long, they're mushy and not nice. But uh, kale does very well. This, these are the winter boar or uh, any uh, of the kales that have boar, B-O-R at the end of it. So there's winter boar, there's purple boar, there's, I don't know, a bunch of different boars. Uh, it's, it's a curly kale, and uh, I use it in smoothies all year round. I just take it out of the freezer and put it into a smoothie with uh, fruits and juices. It seems that uh, the only thing that will bother this is the deer after all, everything else is gone from the garden and we got snow, then the deer come in and look for kale. I don't know what that says about kale, but. <laughs> How many of you grow kohlrabi? Anybody? Um, it's a funky looking vegetable. It almost looks like something from outer space. <laughs> they come in purple and green. Some of the green varieties will store for six months or more. You can use it in a stir fry, you can use it in a salad. It's crunchy. It's in the, in the broccoli family, in the brassica family. Uh, so it has a little bit of that flavor. And I like it. It's fairly fast growing, not as fast growing as a radish, but really quite fast growing. Lettuces, we all grow lettuces. And my big flaw with lettuces is that I don't plant it often enough. I tell people in my garden count, plant lettuces every week or every three weeks or every month. But so often I'm so busy that it's only when the lettuce is all gone they say, oh, wait a minute, I should have planted some two weeks ago. It's relatively fast growing. I like to, to plant um, reds and greens together because they're pretty in the, in the row. I like to let a few go to seed so that they will drop some seeds and then next spring, before I have a chance to even work the soil, they'll start growing in very cold soil. But I don't want to do that with everything. Uh, leeks there in the middle are uh, one of the things I do best. Uh, they just like my soil, which is a rich alluvial soil near a stream. And uh, you can see from the size of the, the they're a foot long there of the edible part or more. I like to just uh, clean them up, a quarter of them lengthwise, and then chop them uh, across the lengthwise, you know, on the sideways, and put them in Ziploc bags, freeze them for winter. I use them when my, when my onions run out. I use them to make leek and potato soup. They're a great 
a great vegetable. Melons. I don't grow melons most years, but uh, as we, as our, as our summers are getting hotter and hotter with climate change, melons are easier and easier to grow, and I think the people that develop hybrids are doing a better job of melons for the North Country. Again, if you're going to buy seeds, read what the package says. If you buy plants from a greenhouse, you're probably going to have a variety that is going to do well in our climate. Not all melons will. So here are some onions. There, there are three different ways you can grow onions. You can start them from seed indoors, grow them inside for 12 weeks, and then plant them outside. There are some ready to go outside. Uh, you can uh, buy plants, which are these same green things that you get in a six pack at the, at the garden center. They're much more vigorous than the third method, which is to buy those little dry bulbs or little tiny onions and plant those. Those are the cheapest way to do onions, but they're not as vigorous uh, growers as things that you, that you either plant like that or, or start yourself from seed. Uh, here I am uh, mulching my onions, newspapers on the sides, putting straw there, trying to keep the weeds down. Onions don't like weeds. Uh, parsley is, for me, very difficult to get to germinate. It takes a long time. I've read that you're supposed to take water, bring it to a boil, let it sit for five minutes, drop the seeds into the water so that they've got hot water but not boiling water to help them break their dormancy and then plant them. But you know what? A six pack of parsley plants from a, from a greenhouse is an easy way to get six nice plants and it's a lot easier than trying to start your own. I love parsnips. It's the first thing I eat at each spring because I let them stay in the ground all winter. They're a problem child in some ways. They take three weeks to germinate oftentimes. And in the garden, three weeks is, is a lifetime. You, you know, you're already planting something. You want to plant something else there. You think, oh, well, they must have been bad seeds. Speaking of which, Sometimes when we blame things on, bl on bad seeds, they aren't. I'm a firm believer in the biodynamic calendar called Stella Natura. And I'm sorry I didn't take a picture of the calendar itself, but it tells you for every day of the year, for every hour of the day, whether it's good for planting flowers, root crops, leafy greens, uh, and something else. Anyway, there are four different categories. But the key thing is the blackout days. There are blackout days when you shouldn't plant anything. And so I've done some tests. I did it first with lettuce in the house under lights. I saw that I had a leaf day followed by a blackout day. So I planted a six pack on the leaf day. Then I, the next day, I using the same soil mix, the same lights, the same temperature, the same seed package, I planted another six pack of seeds on a blackout day. The seeds I planted on a leaf day germinated 95% and grew nicely. The ones planted on the blackout day germinated around 10% or 15 or 20%. And it took a lot longer. The plants were never as big and bountiful. I said, wow, this is based on the position of the sun, the moon, the stars, and magic. <laughs> the Stella Natura, S-T-E-L-L-A, first word, Natura, N-A-T-U-R-A. And if you go to StellaNatura.com, you can order one. They call, the calendar costs about $15, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't bring one along for you to thumb through, but it, it's really quite amazing. And I think that people have been using the sun and the moon and the stars for centuries before we got so darn scientific. And then we got away from all that and said, oh, well, you know, just plant it. But it's my theory that some of those packets of seeds that we planted and never showed up were not bad seeds, but bad timing. Peas are easy and fun. They grow in cold soil, but not wicked cold soil. You need it to warm up quite a bit. But they're an early crop. Some will say don't need to be trellised, but they do. All peas need to be trellised. 
little chicken wire up the middle, peas on either side. Um, peas and beans, any legume, have the advantage of, of, taking, of fixing nitrogen from the air. Our air is 78% nitrogen, and um, they're able to take that and make, convert it into nitrogen that the roots can use, but they need a bacterium in the soil in order to do that. But you can go to the store, uh, West Lebanon Supply carries it, I'm sure Gardner Supply would have it, and you ask for the inoculant for legumes. And then you put it where you, what I like to do is just uh, take a bowl, put some inoculant in, and a little bit of moisture, and then I'll roll my seeds around in there and I plant it so I know they've been inoculated. But I don't do it every year. Uh, but it does help to get that process going of fixing nitrogen from the air, putting it in your soil. It's free fertilizer. Okay, here is a pepper that uh, I, the seed I got in France, the Espelette pepper, and there's a rock right next to it. That rock is giving it heat at night. And um, I only grow hot peppers. One thing you need to know about peppers, if you're going to save seeds from peppers like this one, I save the seeds from the Espelette pepper just like I do with my, my tomato from France. Um, they're promiscuous. So if you plant the Espelette next to a green pepper or another hot pepper, they're going to hybridize. And then you won't have the pure seed. Uh, if you're living in Hanover and your neighbor plants hot peppers and you plant green peppers and you save the seeds, the next year you might have a green pepper that's hot. <laughs> um, potatoes uh, do very well for me. I use a, uh, a post hole digger. You see it up there at the top. It's a two-handed thing that allows you to dig down. I dig down about eight inches or 10 inches I add some pro-growth fertilizer, I stir it up with a little compost maybe, and then I take a cut piece of potato, put it in there, and it grows into a plant. The best I've ever done is five pounds of potatoes from one chunk. Usually you get about a pound. So if you want 50 pounds of potatoes, you need 50 potato plants. And then of course you have to store them and keep the mice away from them, it's complicated. But I love potatoes. Here they are about ready for hilling. So filling those holes in is very easy, an easy way to, to, uh, to do the hilling. And you, you, what you need to know is that a potato that you plant will send roots down and then the new potatoes will be above that chunk. So you have to have six inches of soil above the chunk if you want to have enough room for uh, lots of potatoes. I grow four kinds of potatoes usually. Uh, the Kennebec is the, is the most productive. That's a white potato from Maine. And they're big and they're bountiful. I like sun, uh, not sun gold, uh, Yukon gold as a yellow potato. For years I had a purple potato. This is not that one, but a, a friend of mine who passed on had given me some purple potatoes to, to grow. And I kept growing this year's crop to next year's crop and so forth. But then uh, back in 2008 or earlier, when we had the uh, tomato blight and, and the early uh, blight got on the tomatoes, I was told you shouldn't keep your, any potatoes over for replanting because potatoes are living organisms and they can carry that blight, the same uh, blight that affects uh, tomatoes can get into potatoes. So I let them go. But I do grow a, a purple potato and, and then a red potato. The red Pontiac, I grew the same red Pontiac for 25 years. I never bought a potato. I, I, I grew them and I stored them and I replanted them. Again, when we had that blight and I had to let everything go. Um, but this is showing the, the uh, scab. There's nothing wrong with those potatoes. I'll eat those, but they're ugly. You couldn't sell them if you were a farmer. Uh, but you just take a potato peeler and peel that off. Um, black molly is this one, and it has the advantage of when you cook it, it stays purple. It's one of the few things that does not lose its purpleness on cooking. Black molly, yes? Why do you get so 
it's a fungal disease. And I've been growing for 40 years in the same place. No matter how much crop rotation I do, I'm going to get potato scabs sometimes, and I'm going to get uh, various blights and other things in my tomatoes. It would, yes, if you, if you dug up a new piece of lawn, 10 foot by 10 foot, each year and moved around, you'd do much better than if you have a, a garden half the size of this room, as I do, and use the same piece of garden no matter how much you rotate. You're still going to have fungal diseases. Uh, kids love to garden, and I think potatoes and carrots are the two things that my grandkids have grown best. They are made this arrangement, and I thought, that's so beautiful. There are those 12-inch carrots down at the bottom. Uh, pumpkins are fun, take up a lot of space. They, they send out runners that go long distances. So you have to let them go across a field or, or your lawn. And that gets complicated because then you can't mow the lawn. Um, one nice thing you can do with pumpkins is if you have a lot of grandkids, you can give them a, an an eight penny nail and have them carve their initials into a green pumpkin. And then it will scab up and when the pumpkin is that size, they'll see which one is theirs because they wrote their name on it. And it will be scarred right into it. Radishes are relatively easy to grow. I don't grow a lot of radishes, but I was reading uh, Ed Smith's Vegetable Gardener's Companion this morning when I was getting ready to do this. He pointed out a couple of things. He said, radishes get bitter, they're always sharp, but they get bitter if they're too old. And that's been my problem. I pick a few and they're pretty tasty and then, uh, well, I'm not going to eat all these. I'll just leave them in the ground and I'll pick them later. So I pick them later and they're bitter. So he said, when you get your radish just right, pick them all and keep them in the refrigerator because they keep in the refrigerator real well. So I think that's a solution. They're very fast growing. They're good for small children to grow because they'll germinate in three days. Rhubarb, another perennial, wonderful plant. You have to start from roots. Uh, I, I got, they continue to get a little bit bigger each year, the more and more and spread. So last year I put an ad in uh, my town listserv saying, come get rhubarb plants. And I, we just dug up two thirds of what I had because I just had way more rhubarb than the, the Russian army could consume. Uh, rutabagas. Is there anybody besides me that grows rutabagas? Oh, I'm going to get a bumper sticker that says, eat more rutabagas. <laughs> rutabagas are fabulous. You look at that. That's a six, seven, eight inch long rutabaga. It's not bothered by anything, although I've been told that flea beetles will sometimes attack them and they never have for me. You use them just like potatoes. Boil them up. You can put them in a stew, and unlike, if I make a beef stew, I like to eat it for a week. I make a huge quantity. But the potatoes get mushy and fall apart. If I put in chunks of rutabaga, they stay nice. They don't fall apart. Um, how many people would like to make the pledge to try rutabagas this year? Put your hand up. There we go, there we go. All right. Um, spinach is an early spring crop. And it takes a lot of spinach to make a meal. I like to eat it raw better than uh, cooked. It doesn't do well in the hot, so plant it early on or late in the season. Summer squash, and I have to say, the, the, the picture on the left is not my garden. I would never be that compulsive, but I had a client once that did that with wooden boards, and they, she had no weeds whatsoever in the whole garden. But, um, Summer squash, again, I find trouble with striped cucumber beetles. I, I cover the, the, the hills or the, or the beds with uh, row cover. That really helps. There are other things you should know, one of which is, well, there we go. There's row, co row cover or remay. That'll keep the, uh, the insects off. Uh, the best zucchini, as far as I'm concerned, is called Romanesco. And do I have a picture? No, I don't. Well, maybe later on we'll find one. But uh, Romanesco zucchini can get to be this big and still be edible. Um, most zucchinis you want to eat when they're small and tender, but this, it's a striped zucchini. And um, I also found that my uh, dogs that 
have weight problems, loves zucchini. You can, you can cook up some zucchini or even raw zucchini in a dog's dish with their kibbles. Will, will bulk out their tummy and make them feel like they've had a big meal. And uh, zucchini is very easy to grow. As you've heard the jokes about, you know, zucchini in August and cars unlocked and so forth. <laughs> uh, of the winter squashes, there are only two that I grow generally. Uh, Waltham butternut, which is this one, and uh, the blue hubbard. The blue hubbard, I once kept one, maybe that one, for a year. Uh, because it's so big, you really <laughs> have to process it. And well, the, the easiest thing to do is take a meat cleaver or a machete and split it in half, or a chainsaw. <laughs> How many of you have a chainsaw? Anybody? <laughs> I use an axe. There we go, an axe. That'll work too. Uh, steam it up in, in, uh, on a baking pan in, in the oven with, with water or put it in a big pot and, and, and cook it slowly, then, then peel it off the, the uh, peels and put it in Ziploc bags, freeze it. But that's a, that's a 20 pound blue Hubbard there. But they're great. Um, Here's my sweet potato success, my one success with sweet potatoes. I've tried three sweet potatoes three times. This was a garden out in Newport. We, uh, this is on harvesting time. It's under uh, remade to keep heat in. There are uh, uh, water tapes here to deliver water. There was black plastic over the, so I make a bed, I cover it with black plastic, cut an X, put in a little slip, they call it. It's a little green growing thing that looks like it's almost dead, but you get it in the mail. Stick that in there, and then put the, the remay over it. And we, in a 32-foot bed, we got 65 pounds of, of sweet potatoes. In my particular soil back in Cornish Flat, I, I just get small, gnarly ones, and uh, I'm never doing it again. <laughs> I did it this last year. I found a six-pack of started plants, nice big plants in Woodstock at the uh, hardware store. I said, this is fabulous. So slapped them in, and uh, they didn't do much. But that was a good year there. So it can be done. Talking about putting in some vegetables in your flower beds, look how beautiful Bright Light Swiss chard is. You can put those in and then eat them when they're ready. What's interesting is that beets and Swiss chard are the same genetic material that just for hundreds of years, some were, were grown and selected for having good leaves and stalks, and others for having big roots. But if you dig up your Swiss chard in the fall, you can eat the roots, boil them up just like um, beets. They taste exactly like beets. Tomatillos, uh, good for salsa. You need male and female plants. The first time I did it, I didn't know that. And I've made a lot of mistakes in my day. But I said, oh, it's a big plant. I'm just going to have one. Well, <laughs> you can't just have one uh, for, to, if you want to have the fruit. Here are tomatoes being planted sideways. You dig a hole, a little trench for the stem, and you tip that up, cover it all over. And, and the, the part of the stem, which is buried, becomes root, and you have uh, a, a, a bigger root system. Bigger root system is a better way of, of getting more tomatoes. Um, you need to support them. Here you'll see that I have not only stakes, but there's also a cage there. They get so laden with fruit that they want to tip over if you just have them in a cage. If you get a cage, get the 54-inch cage with four legs. A lot of cages are pretty. They're painted yellow and blue and purple. Designer colors are available now but they're on three legs and they're shorter. So you want the big, tall ones. There's a sucker in between the two branches here. Uh, that's the sucker. And I snip that out uh, to get better production. There's my fair, favorite cherry, sun gold. It's a hybrid tomato, but it is so disease resistant and productive and tasty. Ah. How many of you know Sun Golds? Of course. Um, I save seeds. You can do it just by doing this. Take some seeds and put them on a paper towel, dry them out, then take your fingers when they're dried out and get the seeds away from the pulp. You can also put it in water in a bowl and let the pulp rot off in you know, three days. 
So there's the zucchini we like so much, the Romanesco. That striped zucchini is. It's is, crostata, isn't it? Yeah, Romanesco. It's cro Romanesco is the broccoli cauliflower thing. That's crostata, I think. Well, I've always called this the Romanesco uh, zucchini, and I find the names overlap sometimes, and I know what you're talking about. So um, there's my email, henry.homeyer comcast.net. And um, if you want, afterwards, uh, now that the, the Daily UV and Hearcast has gone down as a site to get my gardening articles, I'm trying to work out something so that I will uh, be able to share my weekly writings with you folks. And I'm going to be sitting at a table over there signing books. And I'll have a sign up. You can give me your email address, and I'll put you on the list. When I figure out what I'm doing, I'll let you know. So that's it. Thank you for coming. I'll answer a few questions if you have them.